Hi everybody, welcome to Woodworking Wisdom. My name's Colin Way, and we've got Steph behind the camera today. Um, it's just, just bunging me straight into it uh, with no warning whatsoever. Um, and, but today, what we're going to do is going to do some Banksia and resin um, uh, combinations, as it were. We, we keep being asked about resin, um, and we keep being asked about Banksia nuts. So I thought, well, let's merge the two together and see what we get i've also in the last few weeks we've been doing some uh, easy wood tools as well so there's another opportunity to get to use those to show you what they work like on resin as well um, and the hollowing uh, easy wood tools that i've been um sort of championing um I'll, we'll be able to use those inside the straight probe version anyway so um welcome if you're um regulars to the channel and uh, and also welcome if you're if you're new um it, it's another hour, I think, at least today of uh, of turning. But we've got to start with the the actual resin casting. So, um, if we pop over to the bench, we're going to just cast one of these Banksia nuts. Now, um, in preparation, he says in preparation. So that's one of the Banksias. In fact, Steph, can we just go to that overhead camera so I can pop that in? That's one of the um, the resin vase shapes that I've uh, that I've done. Um, in preparation for today, and I've used uh, just a, a Mika powder on this one, a nice white one, just to so show off those um, little Banksia holes. Um, and just as an explanation as to what all of this kit is, or what the two products are, um, Banksia nuts firstly. Okay, if you've never seen a Banksia nut before, there's a rather large Banksia nut. They can be gnarly shapes. This is... Um, um, basically, it's a holder for lots of uh, seeds. So it's like a cone, note, as it were. Each one of these little lips here contains a seed. Um, and it's an Australian uh, cone. So the seeds then spread in the heat. Um, they travel for miles and then they, they self-seed themselves. So that's what they are. When we get hold of them, most of the seeds have gone. So they're just empty holes. Um, and to do this project, what we're going to have to do when we're casting is add pressure. Now, as a company, we don't sell pressure pots at the moment. They are widely available on the internet, though. Um, I've got my um, my pressure pot here, which is a converted blue a glue pot, glue pressure pot, um, and it works perfectly. We're casting under a pressure of around about. It's, it can be anywhere really between forty and sixty psi. So it's around about three bar, three and a half to four bar. Um, and that does the job. And the, the reason we use pressure um, is to get rid of the air. Well, it's not, it doesn't actually get rid of it. It shrinks the air to beyond our eyesight, and it allows that resin then to soak into all those areas that would have been normal, normal um, air pockets. So it's good if you've got bubbles, if you want to try to create a clear um, cast. Or in this case, we're trying to get into all those little holes that would normally be air pockets on the, on the bank seeing that. Um, now, we need to have a vessel to hold the banks here in, and I have strategically placed as far away as me as possible um, uh, a pre-cut banks here nut. Now, that's the big one, okay? That's the small one. To avoid having to turn down to a diameter and make a horrible mess straight away, I've chosen a small one that just happens to fit the, the jar that I've got here. Now, you can see exactly where these jars come from. There we are. That will be for the big banks here nut. Um, fruit juice bottles, that sort of stuff. And all we've done, don't, don't need that one. Um, all we've done is just cut the top off. Um, and now hopefully, I did try this earlier, we can get this one in. With a little bit of gentle persuasion. Thank you, Steph. Okay, all the way down. Now, this is quite good because this has grabbed the Banksia nut in here. Um, like I say, if we were doing a bigger one and we wanted to try and get that one in here, all you're going to do is cut the ends off, turn it down to the diameter needed. So use your calipers, check diameter, take a little bit off, stop the lathe, check the diameter, and so on until you get it the right fit to go in. Don't forget you do, you do have to have the resin um, able to flow around the piece, so don't create an airlock if you do turn around. Um, you want to have a little bit of a gap all the way around. Um, and what I have found with doing these also is if you, like me, I've got this, this Banksy nut just below the level of this, this bit of plastic here. Um, what I found first cast is I put right up to the top here with resin, and then I added pressure. And, of course, 
the resin then goes into all the voids that it would normally have not have. So the resin starts to drop. So after your first, I would say, just put a bit of pressure in there, leave it for about 20 minutes, take it out, and then re-pour. Um, and then back in the pressure pot, you should be right up to the top, to the point where you get what I have here. Now, ignore this bit of wood on the bottom. This is, um, you can, see, well, let me go to, again, the overhead camera stuff, sorry. Um, you can see here that we've got the remnants of the bottom of the bottle here. I could just glued on a couple of bits of timber. So the oak piece at the bottom, and this was um, a part of the hold down bit of timber that uh, that we started with. We're going to do a bit of this in a minute. So it's already sort of part of the resin, which creates a really nice, strong um, top and tail. The reason that I've had to add those is we need, we're need we going to turn between centers to start with, and I'm actually going to have this section, this piece of oak down here to, to use to create a, a hold for the, the um, chuck. So that's where we've got to. That's I've peeled off the outside bottle, apart from a little bit I couldn't quite get to on the bottom here. So that's ready to turn in a second. But let's just mix and get this one prepped for the pressure mold. Now, I said that on this one, I've got this piece of timber up here. This is simply there. Put that down to use with a bit of tape to stop that Banksy nut from floating as we as we add the solution. Because, of course, it does. You know, Banksy and nuts are buoyant like any timber. So I just add a bit of pressure downward. Try not to bring the walls of the, the plastic in too far. You don't want to sort of misshape that plastic. So there we are, one piece all the way around. That should be enough to hold it down. Look, okay, and that still gives us plenty of room to, to pour that resin in around it. But then once we get to the top, that will obviously take in some of the resin and be, you know, nice and firm for when we come to um, turn it again later. So that's there. Right then. So our resin, I'm using the Eco Epoxy. Um, and we last time we used resin, we were getting asked a lot of questions about the casting itself. Now, between Christmas and New Year, we're going to be, um, it won't be a live one because um, I'll be full of sherry by that time, I should imagine. So what we'll do um, is the week before, myself and Steph are going to record um, a, a video for you, which is going to be all about making pen blanks with this resin. We go into a lot of detail when it comes to the mixing, the casting, and, and all those sorts of things. For those of you that have a pressure pot, a vacuum chamber, and for those of you that have none of that equipment at all and just want to give it a go. All right, so we're going to have a play around with that. And I think we've got another question over there. Steph, yes? Yeah, Maria's asked, are Banksy and that's naturally hollowed in the middle or have those been hollowed out? So, no, so we're going to go through that process, Maria. So that little vase there, this is one of my, um, I, I tend to call these grass pots. Grass pots because, and, and dried grass pots, um, I don't want to think about water and putting water in it, so I don't want to think about liners, all those sorts of things. Also means I can cheat a little bit and leave a little bit of weight in the bottom so that they're nice and bottom heavy. So you can put your tall grasses in and um, and they still stay upright. So it just uh, avoids the, the question about, oh, how thin have you gone and all those sorts of things. There's a little bit of way of cheating, really. So no, we're going to hollow that out. We're going to start with the drill bit and then use the, the hollowing tools. In terms of are they hollow through the seed holes? Yes, they are. They're, there's a little... Um, Oh, what sort of shape? It's like a torpedo-shaped seed that's inside each of these little holes here. And they go right the way through to the middle. Um, I Oh, here we go. Let's, there we go. Look, let's have a look at that one. So that's a slice of one that I've just taken. I literally just took the end off, and that's the inside. So you can see the sort of thing we've got. It's quite a pretty piece. This um, The redness on the outside is actually a layer of like velvet material. Um, it's, it's quite an interesting, um, interesting little, little piece of, I want to, I'm going to call it wood because that's the, the, that's what it takes on. That's the sort of feel it takes on right then. So mixing, I'm going to swap cameras, Steph. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's my fault. Yeah. I just wanted to say as well, we've had a few people on chat the last couple of weeks trying to upload media to our website. Um, I just wanted to say as well, I'm going to share the link in the chat in a minute. Um, but if you are still having issues, then I think it's been worked out that if you don't allow cookies on our website, then you won't be able to see the button to upload. So that's where the downfall is. Okay. So you need to allow the cookies to be able to upload. You have to sell your soul, accept all cookies. Exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So let's get a few things out of the way. I'm going to mix. So this particular resin is a two to one. 
Okay, two to one, and it's two to one by volume, not weight, which are very, very different things. If you have a resin that's two to one um, or one to one by um, by uh, weight, you may be confused, or if you didn't realize, you may be confused that you've got two different amounts of solution, but it's done on weight, remember. This is done on volume. So we measure this out in a jar, um, where the weight one you would measure in a jar, but over scales so again just just be aware of that because it does make a difference with resin quite important to get the mix right otherwise you'll have trouble with setting or you'll get heat and all sorts of things go wrong um so just you know read the instructions this one says um by volume so i'm going to go 200 milliliters um with the solution with the resin itself and then we're going to go 100 with a hardener There we are. Yes, I should be wearing gloves. Again, strategically place them out of my way. It's all right there, but down beside me. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this quite quickly. Um, 100 milliliters of the hard nut. Wait for it to settle a little bit. There we are. That should do us there. It's probably a little bit too much. You know, it's very difficult to measure exactly how much I'm going to need for this project. So what I always tend to do is have a backup close by. I've got a piece of some lovely Australian Goldfield burr here. So some nice uh, gnarly burr um, in a mold ready to turn, uh, ready to mold uh, for uh, jewellery. Um, little buttons there so that's if I have any left at the end we're also in this one we're going to add a little bit of the Mika powder I'm going to go red on this one I've done white on the previous uh, vase um, and I've got white for the one that we're going to turn today but I'm going to go red just because a little bit of a change so let's do a bit of mixing first without the Mika powder and then we'll add the powder in you can add resin of course uh, you can have pigment instead of the Mika powders, of course, to depending on which uh, resin you're going to be using will depend on what you can use. I prefer to do this by hand. If you do it with a mixing wand on a drill, then you do tend to get a fair bit of bubbling. You have to leave it to settle for a little bit longer. You can use the two pot method where you're going to where you mix and then transfer into another pot just to make sure you've got no residue on the outside of the pot, all those sorts of things. Um, and that's if you're into that sort of thing, then you'll start to pick up. Cool. Well, we've had a quick question about um, the Banksia nuts asking, do you clean up seed pods before pouring the resin? Yeah, I tend to take the airline to them. So just get the airline, put a good set of goggles or, um, or a visor on, get the airline going and blow everything out, um, pick out with um, a braddle or something. Um, but yeah, absolutely. As long as that void's nice and hollow, then you get a good, good fill of resin. Here we are. I'm not measuring this, this, this powder, just putting in what I think is probably half a teaspoon. You'd be surprised, actually, with well, with pigments, completely different thing. With pigments, then you'll put in uh, just a little touch on the end of a toothpick. That would be enough. But with make powders, you just need a little bit more. I'll show the overhead camera in a minute what we've got, what sort of solution. And this, by the time we should, well, by the time I finish mixing it, will be pretty much opaque. You won't be able to see through it at all. But that's fine because we don't want to, of course. It's going to fill holes as opposed to... Um, be transparent to see things through. There we are. Let's just show the overhead camera. You can sort of see what we've got. It's a nice sort of shimmery metallic finish with these Mika powders.
There we are. That's enough. This particular um, resin, you can, you've got a good open time. You've probably got a good couple of hours open time before you have to worry about it. So you could now leave that for 20 minutes, let the bubbles build, um, or not build, let the bubbles sort of come to the surface, which really help the clarity. It's not going to matter in my case because we're putting it in a pressure pot. So all the bubbles are going to disappear anyway. So I don't have to worry too much about that. So here we go. We've got our prepped vessel. And I'm just going to start pouring. We want to make sure we get a good a good fill. Now, look, I've got my lovely uh, beach bench here, but I have got a bit of waste material down as well. So it'd be a good idea to get some either another bit of board or a bit of paper, that sort of stuff, to make sure that you're not going to damage that lovely bench. If you have an accident with resin, you pretty much have to sand the stuff off once it dries. You can wipe it up, but it'll be everywhere, okay? And it's not the easiest stuff to get off. So, okay, let's start pouring. Don't go too quick. I want to make sure it's filling every bit. Same thing here. If you want to just wait a little bit, start filling, then just leave it for 10 minutes. Let it fill its way down through. And do. If you can hear lots of machinery noises, we've got some training going on next door. So we are we're training some of the shop staff in a variety of machines and power tools and hand tools. There we are. That wasn't a bad measure, to be honest. Just stop there for a minute, let it fill. There we go. Let's just go a wee bit more. There we are, look, I've got hardly any left in that, that jug. So that was good. So I don't need to fill the other mold. Just to stop drips and stuff, I'm gonna wipe things clean. Right there, that's looking good. I'm not going to add any more to that. Bubbles are coming up. I'd like to leave that for 10 minutes, really, before I do anything. But let's say we've waited 10 minutes. We poured in the re the rest of that resin, which is literally just a tablespoonful there. Um, once we're happy with that, then it can go into the pressure pot. So we'll we'll go through the process. So I've just made this little wooden um this wooden holder really to make things easier for getting down into that pressure pot. And if I do get any spillages, then it doesn't damage my pressure pot. There we are. Then the lid can go on. Colin, while you're doing those bits up, um, we've had a question here from Pete. Um, he said, is there a minimum temperature for casting resin? His workshop is pretty cold in winter, but it doesn't want to bring the pressure pot into the house. Yeah, no, the, the colder the better, if I'm honest with you. Within reason, of course, you wouldn't want to be, um, you know, sub-zero temperatures. But cold is better than heat because cold makes the pressure, uh, makes the resin go off slower. Um, and if you, you know, if you have it in a very hot environment, it goes off very quickly. That's where you get issues with bubbles, you get issues with thermal heat up. Um, you know, those sorts of things. So, no, you've got no problems. Um, there's a couple of good videos on by professional resin table makers, um, and they actually invest in um, uh, cooled tables. Where they're actually pumping cool air onto the underside of the tables to keep it um, colder for longer. So the coldness isn't an issue at all. There we are. We'll do that up properly, and then I'll connect my airline to it. And like I say, I want to be up to about three, three to four bar, three, three and a half most of the time. 40 to 60 PSI, um, and leave it. I mean, it depends on the resin you got. This curing time on this one is, I'd leave it in here a good 48 to 
Yeah, yeah, about forty-eight hours. I would, I would have think, I would have guessed. Um, longer if I've not need, if I don't need to get to it. It won't be set and ready to work for a, for sort of three or four days. So I'll leave it in there for a little while. Some resins cure much quicker than that. Some resins will be ready to demold in an hour, um, and and some in between. So you have to read the instructions. Remember what I said about weight uh, or volume. Um, and the pressure pots, like I say, we don't sell the pressure pots, but they are available online. Um, and they're sold generally in sizes. So, um, you know, right from little tiny ones for about 250 quid, right the way up to four or 500 pounds for a much bigger one. Um, I would say for most of us, the smaller ones are absolutely fine. If you're starting to cast um, bowls and things like that, that's a little bit more experience needed and required for that, as in the types of resin, curing times, uh, and, and all those sorts of things, uh, way beyond my uh, skill level, I'm afraid, um, at the moment. But yeah, there we are. That's that. Once two or three days have gone, or three or four days have gone, rather, then I'll take it out um, of the pressure pot. Um, cut and peel away the plastic bottle um, and then this one was already here remember but this one i've glued on with epoxy resin okay and really quite important epoxy resin the strongest i found because we are physically going to be holding that at one point um, and that will be the only hold so we've got to be fairly fairly sure that that's going to grip so let's go over to the lathe we'll get this held between centers and we look at how to how to um, physically turn this. So back to our regular setup here. I've got a visor because I'm going to use the visor. I'm, you know, you're never quite sure. Um, I'm going to make sure we use the, the tailstock as much as possible, but there will be a point where we don't have the tailstock to use. Normally, I don't wear a visor because I'd like to, for you to, to hear what I'm saying. We are going to, um, well, I am going to put a visor on um, and sacrifice a little bit of the, the uh, sound quality just to make sure i'm i'm alive by the end of the video today um i don't i'm not taking that lightly at all i'm i'm very serious when i say it but um we just need to be a little bit careful on this sort of thing and any natural edges and and, and large turnings just go careful you have no need to talk for a mic um in your normal workshop i wouldn't have thought so there's no excuse i'm gonna have dust extraction running if you've never turned resin, you'll see why in a minute. It's um, it's very, it builds up a lot of static. I don't have a lot of, um, a lot of hose here for any explosions or things like that to happen. But it's always something to think about. Um, static electricity that builds up. Um, the the um, uh, the shavings that come off the resin will stick to it and stick to your hands, stick to whatever protection you're wearing, goggles, visors, all those sorts of things. So I'll try to get as much of that away as possible. Um, you can't put it on the garden. You can't put it in the compost. It goes into your um, your waste for the, the bin man to collect. Um, it's non-recyclable. So I'm trying to answer all of those questions before we get to it. Um, this is an eco epoxy, which means that it's 80% um, of its makeup is from plant-based uh, products. But once it's dry and cured, then it is the same as anything else. It, uh, it needs to be disposed of responsibly. Um, unfortunately, in this case, it does mean going into uh, the waste bin as opposed to compost heap, okay, which all your other timber can. So make sure you've emptied your dust extractor before you start. And I have. I've got an empty bag in there so I can dispose of that separately, okay? Right. Lay speed is zero. Turn the lathe on. Have we got any questions before we start? Um, no. no, we're all good. I'm just going to have a quick sip. Before we start, do you want to turn my mic off just briefly while I put my visor on? That should be all right, shouldn't it? Anybody hear me okay? Yeah, I can see see the, the volume bars going up. Right, okay. So all I'm going to do first, I'm going to create a whole point for the chuck. We're going to use the little SK100, the new SK100, which is the lovely square key. Um, and on that square key or on that chuck, we're going to use the H jaws. So lovely deep gripper section. Be perfect for holding that area there. So I'm going to take a measurement with my divide, um, with my calipers, sorry. Okay. 
Right. And on this, I'm going to use a, um, a bowl gouge just initially. I'm not going to go straight into my easy wood tools, only because my preference. But there is a reason I specific, specifically picked oak because it's so hard. So diameter for the chuck, long way to go yet. Let's have a quick look at that. I'm just going to check that before we go any further. So diameter-wise, yeah, we've got loads to go yet. Let's go back with the gouge. down pretty much to the right diameter. And that's it. We're going to stop there. Okay, so let's get the chuck on. Let me double check my measurement. We're near enough there now with the, the jaw measurement. And remember, to start with, we're going to have the, um, the tailstock sensor in. You're going to be using the tailstock. So even though the chuck's connected, we will still go for that extra support of the tailstock. Make sure we're good. Bit of pressure, and now we can turn the the main outside shape. We're also going to drill as much of this away as possible. It just helps, you know. Um, drilling the hole takes taking the bulk away is just going to save a huge amount of time when it comes to hollowing. So now we can start turning. All right, Steph, ready to go? Okay, I'm going to start with the the rougher, so the easy wood rougher. And what I've done is I've added I've added a um, negative rake. Uh, scraping tip on this one so we've got the negative rake instead of the standard that will calm things down massively and remember with the the easy wood tools you can side cut or you can plunge cut it's entirely up to you i'm already getting covered in the stuff because i've neglected to remember the little chip deflector which which you can add to them so let's go side cut and i'm going to just start roughing down
So I'm going to stop this and just let you see and try and wet, wet, wipe some of the shavings off of me. Um, when you go beyond, when you get the solid round, that's where you get those constant ribbons because they're not broken mid-cut. And so that's where you will end up having a, a, a fresh haircut, um, which looks quite funny. But look, we're already starting to break through into the re the, um, the bank center and it already re sort of re revealing itself. So we're going to do a few more cuts. We will reveal a lot more than this, but I just want to get down to the solid round. You'll see the shaving stand up and we get a long line in the air. I'm just putting my thumb there to stop myself getting covered. Right, there we are. And I'm not going to use the full length of this piece either. You might want to be a little bit more conservative with your cutting and a little bit more accurate with the sizes that you do. Um, but I'm not going to. I know how this works. Um, and too long will create a few more problems, certainly for a short video like this anyway. So I'm going to start the shape now. We'll end it about... So around about... There is where we're going to end. Don't hold me to that, though. The shape screams out a different size than we will. Right, time for the extractor. I'm getting dust now from that resin. Steph, could I ask you to just pop that on for me? Because, uh, again, another thing that I haven't done is connect the extractor. Now, before I say, oh, that's it, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop the lathe and just double check. It's looking lovely. I love this. And look how that resin has filled all of those holes. Now, you could, if you wanted to, you can just take all the rest of this resin away. I quite like leaving some of that there. And the last one, it looks quite nice, is a real a real blend. So I'm going to probably stop at that bit. But we've got some questions first. Uh, so I've had a question from Robert Richards. He said, would Jason's negative rate hollowers work as well for roughing down? Yes, definitely. Any negative rate works brilliantly. Also, you look quite silly. You look like someone had just attacked you with silly string. It was great. <laughs> oh, there's a lot more to go yet. So um, we'll carry on. Just going to use the detailer to take in a little bit of the, get a little bit more of that waste out from here. And then back to that negative rake. Um, just quickly, the overhead cameras going in and out quite a lot. You might want to. 
maybe zoom in a little bit. Zoom in, yeah. Maybe Whilst I'm chat. zooming in. I think it's being framed by something on the chat. Steph, would you grab me in with that box of tools on there, the Easywood tools, the parting tool, please? Yeah, it's got a white handle, white maple handle. What I don't want to do is go to the final depth. If I do that, I won't have enough strength to do the actual following. So we're about there. We'll do us. Then I can round my corner over. And we'll finish the shape off once we've done the inside. So I'm just getting the blend right first. And it's a very personal thing. It's, you know, you everyone's got their own idea of the right shape. This is mine. go all right then a little bit more this timber away okay thank you Steph perfect Lovely. Let's just drop that tool rest down a bit. Did you have a question then? I did, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I have a question from um, Woodwork Learner. Would raising the handle of a standard carbide tool create a negative rake? It probably, yeah, if you think about it, yeah, you'd have to come up quite a long way. But yeah, the minute you start changing that angle in the front, you'll start calming it down a little bit so when you go you'd have to come right the way up mine um but you can see when i was using that standard uh detail how aggressive it was it was hooking it was grabbing quite aggressively so yeah i'd have to come right the way up to do it but yeah in a way you would you you'd do that So I'm just going to release some of the pressure now. There we are. Brilliant. It's come off. Get that out of the way. Really pretty this is. You know, you've got that lovely velvet in and around there. You do need to leave some strength because of that. So that's why I'm left that quite, you know, so bulky. So let's take a drill bit to that now. I've got a few bits here. I like to go as big as I can with this. And even if it means a two-prong attack. So going with the big one first, then finish with the small one because that's only a short one. Then that's fine. I'll do that. So that's what we're going to do. So get my drill chuck. Get my speed controller over with me so I can get to it quickly if I need to. Tool rest can come out of the way a little bit.
There we are. That's, that's as far as that one's going to go. So that one's all the way up. Okay, so let's go down just a little bit further with this one. So it's a bit smaller. This one's around about 28 mil. Let me just measure how far I'm going to go in. So, yeah, okay. That's how easy it cuts. You can see that. That was going through that quite uh, quite easily. That'll do us. And once we've done with this, we can get rid of the tail stock altogether. Take our drill chuck away. One side. Now, pretty much everything I'm going to do is going to be a combination between the hollower, sorry, the rougher and the hollower. We've already got a lot of that work done for us. Now, one other tip, and I've learned this through the hard way. Don't go too thin. These don't like going too thin. This one here is around about, I would have said about five mil. Um, you go too much thinner. The, it's not the resin that pops out. It's the eye surrounding it. So it's the darker patch around that resin that, that pops. Um, I have had on this particular one, I've had to glue three pieces in. There's a couple that are close together, maybe those two, and then one separate on its own. There are still, believe it or not, there are still a couple of air holes here as well. You can see those air holes. So a double pressure might, might work even better on that one. But you get a lovely finish from this stuff. So don't go too thin. It's a good excuse not to go thin. There we are. So look at the rim that we've got there. That can be rounded over anyway. Hollower that I'm talking about is this one. And I explained this one to you all when I was presenting the, the woodcut stuff. This is the uh, number one. So the hollowers go from one, two to three. Um, and this is the straight version. So let's bring my speed controller over. And we're going to start nice and gentle. A little bit faster than that. Now that's working right quite well. So remember I said to you, we're going to um, use a combination of the rougher and the hollower. That's because in this sort of style of pot, this the side of it here is quite straight. Um, so the the square um, side, oh, this particular one's a slightly radius one because it's the negative break. But that will act as a little straight edge that feeds down the side of that pot. Because this, this style of pot is open, so people will be able to get their fingers inside, be able to feel what the finish is like. And this is important that, you know, that it's it's nice and clean. And it's even. It's the, the main thing, you know, the, the thickness is nice and even. Until you get to the bottom, that's where we can add a little bit more um, thickness. A little bit more waste away.
stop and have a check. I'm not adding too much pressure. I don't want to add too much sideways pressure. They're not, you know, they're not as strong as sort of solid timber. Um, but the inclusion of resin, though, has made them really robust. So let's go a little bit more now with the hollower. So using my elbow on the back of the handle. And just feeling for the differences in thickness. So we're actually down to the bottom of the, the drill holes. So just blending that curve at the bottom. It's all being done by feel at the moment. So I'm just looking, looking down the side of the, the cutter. So I'm not quite up to the maximum overhang at the moment. I'm probably about 12 mil, half an inch away from it. So I'm, I'm okay for the second. I won't be able to go much deeper though. And we're in as far as my finger can go. Let's just take a measurement with our calipers. Make sure my calipers are registering zero. Yeah. So we're good. We've got a good thickness at the bottom. So around about 10 mil at that point. And about six at that point. I would say that that's, I'm quite happy with that, if I'm honest with you, for the style of pot we've got here. And wherever I get my finger into it, I'm just feeling to make sure it's round. I'm going to have one more, literally one more stab at it. Good. I'm happy. I'm happy. So now we've done that, we can now start to think about finishing the outside shape. Yes, Steph, questions? So I've got a couple of questions. Maria asked a little while ago about how do you keep your visor from steaming up when you're out in a cold workshop? It's really, well, I warm my workshop up. If I'm honest with you, now I was doing this only last night and the night before, and I should be doing the same tonight um, uh, because I'm um, doing some piece work for Santa. So what I tend to do is, as I get home, I'll go and put the, the heater on. I've got an electric heater at the moment. I am looking to get a, a log burner installed in there. But electric heater, just just trickle over just to take the edge off. And then once you're in there and the machines start running, that tends to warm up a little bit. But you're dead right, even to the point where you take your visor and your goggles indoors in the home. Um, that will help just to warm them up before you start. Um, but yeah, it is an issue. It is an issue this time of year. In the UK, we're just starting to get a little bit colder. Now, there's some of some of you in other parts of the world that, that are uh, that are probably saying, "I oh, don't be silly. It's not cold at all yet in the UK." But it's yeah, <laughs> we're for us. We're not used to it. Um, I've had another question from Fuller as well. Has the 
has the epoxy fully penetrated the pod or will a finishing layer be applied to the inside of the vase? No, it's fully penetrated. It's, it's all the way through. You can see when I was hollowing then, you had a mixture of, of resin and um, and the banks here coming out. So it's gone right the way into those holes. This one's actually better than the, the other one that I showed you there. There's no air bubbles at all in any of it. So the pressure, I did keep it in the pressure for a lot longer, mine. I kept it in the pressure pot probably for about four days um, before I could get to it. So it's yeah, it's done the job quite well. Um, I'm going to finish the shape off now and part off. Um, oh, and sand and finish. I'm going to use an oil on this one because I found the oil gives the, the banks in that's a really lovely dark um, sort of look. And a finishing oil, if I have any on the shelf. If not, I'll go for lemon oil because I can see the lemon oil. Um, so we just need to bring that shape around. So let's go with the, the rougher first. Just take away some of the excess. There. Now I'm going to get the detail. I'm just going to side scrape around that curve. There we are. That, I've got that curve flowing over there nicely now. I'm happy with that. So if I go back to the parting tool, and then I just want to put a cut in where we're going to finally part off. That parting tool has got a very thick and strong um, blade here, or hold, blade holder. So I'm just dropping the tool rest so I can cut in more on that centre line. Right, and I'm not going to get too greedy at this stage. I'm going to leave it at that and sand. Steph, sorry, yes, questions? Well, you were going to ask me for something then. What were you I was going to ask you to go and get me something else and uh, finishing order from the... I'll go and find it once I've asked you these questions. Go for it. <laughs> um, so, sorry, Kathy has asked, so with the resin, are you considering this waterproof or would you need to add a glass line that yeah, I'm not considering this waterproof in any way. The resin is fine. Banks in that isn't. Okay, so you would have to add a glass liner if you wanted to use um, use this for water. But this is my grass vase, a dried flower vase. No water intended in here. Perfect. Um, and then my next question is from Old Faithful. What is it making that vibration noise? I was getting it earlier today on a piece only six inches long, held firmly in a tenon, just couldn't work out what or why the noise yeah, well, that was from the parting tool. So that was literally a, a little tiny chatter mark. Um, just, just part of turning. You get it. Yeah. yeah you get so vibration just... for many different reasons, really. I mean, that was vibration from the um, from the, the um, parting tool. You'll get it on very long pieces where the, the actual um, the, the timber is actually whipping. Um, you get it on bevel bounce. You get it on lots of things. But that was literally straight from the, the pressure on the, the parting tool, the side scrape. So, yeah, finishing oil, please. Well, I'm going to pop you onto camera three. Okay. And then I'm going to go and find you some finishing oil. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Should have prepared, shouldn't I? You would hope. <laughs> <laughs> 240. So one, I'm going to go 152, 40, 400. That'll be it. 400 is absolutely ample for banks here. Yeah? And we don't need to go any, any more than that. Uh, 400. We'll have dust extraction running. I'm, I'll am i tell you what, I'm going to put a 100 grit on the top. I'm going to round over that corner a little bit. So I'm going to bully it in with the abrasive as opposed to a tool. There we go. Mm. 
lovely. The mystery hounds just about to come in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. You're wondering what the noise is coming from the dust extractor. It's me abusing the dust extractor and putting things down that I shouldn't. There's a lump of wood down there somewhere. There we are. 150. I'm going to go up and speed a little bit. I know that's against everything we're told when it comes to sounding, but it should work a bit better on this resin. Yeah, I like that. That's looking nice. So 240. And then 400. You've seen me using resin before and we've done some wet sanding with it. I wouldn't, specifically wouldn't do that on this project. And the reason being that because we've added a pigment, quite a heavy one, or the Mika powder, if you wet sand it, you'll sort of impregnate that uh, that Banksia nut so you get a lot sort of white haze all over the place. Um, it is still absorbent, remember, that Banksia. So I won't, I don't want to wet sand. There we go. If I had my, if I had my duster, I would dust the inside of this out. As I don't, we're just going to go for it. What I am going to do, what I am going to do is just take that off the lathe. Chuck and all. I don't want to take it out of the chuck yet because if I do that, I'm going to compromise the accuracy. So I'm just going to take the chuck off, hold it upside down, and tip out any excess of the inside and put it back on again. There we are. Just gone and touch the I'm just going to touch the, touch the extractor nozzle, which has left a, a mark. Let's just turn that off. But that's gone again. Okay. Right, so now we can put the resin, uh, the oil on, and we've got the brush to do that. Will that fit inside? Not quite. Just a little bit of oil. Um, I do want to get this on the inside as well, so I can touch where I can with the brush. 
not going to get all the way there, so I have to go resort to some tissue in a minute. But look, go to the overhead one a second, uh, Steph, if you would. Lovely. You look, the difference that bit of oil makes immediately it brightens everything up and makes that resin really pop. Gorgeous stuff. Right, so a little bit of tissue. Get a good dollop inside. Okay, so what I can do now. I'm going to roughly wipe it. What I mean is I'm not overly concerned. I've still got, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of turning to do. So lay speed is zero. Turn the light on. Remember, oil does take a little bit of time to dry. What I would like to do is leave this now overnight in place or take it, take the chuck off the lathe if you want to carry on use the lathe. Let it dry properly. Come back and burnish it tomorrow with a bit of dry cloth tissue. Just to give it time to set. Okay. But we are going to go straight into it. Like I say, you can take it all down if you want to. So you're just leaving this sort of pattern, or you can leave these little smoky areas entirely up to you, entirely up to the resin that you're using as well, and the colors that you're using. So we're going to part this off next. So same parting tool. When I'm parting, especially when I'm parting off, I just put a very slight tilt on the tool. So the side of the cutter is also um, touching the timber. That gives you quite a smooth finish. If you just go straight in with the front of the cutter, you tend to get quite a ragged finish on that underside. So there we are. We're cutting on center point. I'm going to support the vase, making sure that I've got nothing that's going to grab in the chuck. So I've got around about 10 mil left. I'm going to turn the lathe speed down from 1,300 down to around about 1,000 revs. And just take your time. Don't force the cut. Don't grip onto the vase tightly, otherwise you'll get burnt. All that's going to happen is the vase is going to stop in your fingers. Down to about three mil, and it's off. Okay, so let's go. Just wind, mind this finger, so drop this finger down. Use the thumb to pair. So I'm in control here. My finger here is touching this. My thumb is pairing, so I'm not just blindly going off. I'm actually controlling the the gouge so I can't slip and hit my finger. See how hard that center is. It's still a it's still as hard as timber. There we are. Then what I would do there is take the now you've seen me do this before. Just take the power sander, pop it in the chuck, and just sand that bottom. But it's, it's a really smooth finish already. And if I just take a little bit of little bit of the oil, just to finish that off, wipe off the ends excess, and just give the whole thing a little bit of a wipe over. Um, I'd probably, or you could, come back and burnish that on the buffing wheel as well. Um, tomorrow, that will brighten things up a little bit also. There we are. All right. Nice little, little vase, little grass vase. 
There we are. So that's that one. Any questions there at all, Steph? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, there was one I missed earlier from Cliff. He asked, is the, the drill bits you use, are they sorted or Forstner? Or wave Forstner, sorry. So sawtooth for the, the little uh, 28 mil. The first one was a wave Forstner. Because that is doing a, a, a good job. Because it was um, soft banks, you know, I got away with it. If it was timber, I'd want to go sawtooth all the way. But the first one was a wave. Yes. Um, Fuller has asked, will the oil give a permanent wet look to the resin? No. No, it's sort of, it, it dies back. It's, I think it's quite a tasteful finish. It's not a gloss. It's not a matte. It's that satiny in, in between finish. Um, and the good thing with oil, you don't get polished lines. It's it, it just a, a, a really nice, um, full um, coating. Um, you can buff it up, like I say, with, with the buffing wheels, and it gets even brighter. Um, yeah, I mean, you can treat oil like a French polish. You can build up. You can build up layers, sort of 10, 15 layers, and you'll get it to a glaze, a really hard glaze finish. To do that takes a lot of time. And also... Um, a, a very light coats. We, we always used to say, sort of let the let the rag sniff the tin, and that's it. Don't go any any um, sort of coarser than that, or you know, put too much on than that. But um, no, I like the finish. It's like to say, it's that sort of satiny finish. So not a wet look, more satin. Perfect. And Fuller's also asked, what is the brand or type of oil? Um, he thinks he missed that bit. Oh, that one was the Liberon one. I we we often in here use either the Liberon version or the chestnut one. Um, and to be honest with you, I have found any difference at all. No difference. Finishing oils are a blend of oils. They have a drying agent in. If you go something like um, uh, I was mentioning, lemon oil, citrus oil has no drying agent in. Uh, food safe oils don't have drying agent in, um, and obviously food safe. Um, so those are the reasons, that would be a reason for using finishing oil. Um, finishing oils tend to be known as toy safe. So once dry, okay to be mouthed. Um, uh, the, and the only reason that it's toy safe and not food safe is because of the drying agents in it a lot of the time and some of the other oils in there. So there's, a, you know, there's different reasons for using it. I like the finish a finishing oil gives. Um, so there, yeah, that's my preference. Perfect. All done? I think that's it, yeah. Excellent. Okay, I, I, I do this every single week, Steph. What are we doing on Thursday? Who's doing what on Thursday? Thursday? We have a awesome. combination of Jason and Ben. It's both of them, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. So they're doing, uh, am I allowed to say, is it Santa Plate? They're doing Santa Plate. And Santa and carrots. And, and all sorts of and sherry and things like that. So that's going to be Jason doing the turning and Ben doing the pyrography and the decorating. You have another question? I've got one last question. Sorry, Phyllis just put it in. What is the outgassing period for food safety? Say that again. What is the outgassing period for food safety? If I knew that what that meant, Fuller, I would answer you, but I don't. Um, so uh, maybe let's let's uh, if you send that in as a question, I'll then answer it. Or get the lads to answer it on um, on Thursday, but I'll answer you directly on the emails as well. So, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that means. Sorry. Thank you ever so much, everybody, for stopping by for over an hour now and um, and uh, uh, giving us your time. So thank you very much. Don't forget, if you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. Uh, share it with as many people. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I know a lot of you are already subscribers, so thank you ever so much. We always do appreciate your continued support. And, um, yeah, see you on Thursday. Thanks very much.